So let's talk about skin care and general skin disorders in the pediatric population. Some of the information that we're going to cover you have heard before, like various different types of um, lesions, for instance. You'll need to know those. Um, some of it is things you do see in the adult population, but they're often thought of as childhood disorders, like lice, for instance. Anybody can get lice, but oftentimes people think of children when they think of head lice. So let's talk about some of the differences in the skin of an adult versus a child. The most important thing for you to know is absorption. So with any patient, you have to be careful about applying topical medications because it's still absorbed and it still has a systemic, can create a systemic reaction like topical steroids, for instance. You don't want to apply too many because it can get systemically absorbed and start having systemic effects. But the two things that really affect that absorption with children compared to adults is one, their body surface area compared to the size of their body is more. Um, when they're not, when they're shorter, there's more skin there compared to the size of their body than an adult. So you have more of a surface area in comparison to absorb. In addition, their skin is a lot thinner than adults. So because it's thinner, it's going to absorb at a quicker rate. So you have, especially when you're talking about diaper children, when you're applying creams to their bottom or under the diaper area, anywhere that um, retains heat, and that's usually the place you think of, um, that absorption rate is going to increase even farther. So you have to be really careful about that as well. Um, in pediatrics, we don't have as many problems with skin breakdown like you do in adults. Their skin does tend to hold up a little bit better. They have better skin turgor, so they just um, don't get as much breakdown, but they can absolutely still get breakdown, so you need to be careful of those. So various skin um, lesions. I'm not going to review these because you've talked about these before. You'll need to go back and review this yourself. One kind of tip I can give you when you are documenting um, skin lesions, if you don't know the technical term of a lesion, don't use it. If you don't know what a papule is, don't document that it's a papule because it might not be a papule. It might be a pustule or whatever it be. Um, use, describe it if you don't know what the term is. If you don't know what a papule is, just describe is a firm, raised, red area um, making sure that you are fully describing its size. Um, I'm sure you've seen it, especially if you've seen the wound care nurses coming around. They're very particular. They measure it, and they have um, a lot of programs now where they have specific rulers that measure the width and the length. Um, they measure depth if it's a deeper wound. They'll take pictures with that um, measurement device beside it. So being very specific on those lesions is important when you're describing them. It's being as objective as you can because you can't really compare if it's getting better or worse from nurse to nurse if you don't have something to go by. So other things to document about it, does it hurt? Does it itch? Itching is very important, not so much because of the skin lesion, but when things itch, especially children, no matter how much you tell them, adults have that problem too, um, if is they want to scratch. Um, the reason scratching is a big problem is you can break that skin and create a secondary infection. So your primary purpose of preventing itching is to decrease that risk of a secondary infection from the scratching that occurs. Um, a lot of times people think like with your, your poison ivy, poison oak, those kind of things. They think you shouldn't scratch because you're going to spread it through scratching. You can't spread those through scratching um, unless the oils are under your nails. It's the oil from the plant itself that causes the symptoms. So just the scratching of the lesion is not going to um, spread that reaction. It is the, the, um, the secondary infection risk is what you're really concerned about. Um, so the best way to prevent itching and subsis subsequent scratching, um, using antihistamines like your diphenhydramine, um, whether it be they make topical diphenhydramine, you can take the systemic diphenhydramine, 
all those work really well to help with that itching. Emollients work very well. So emollients are your soothing items. Think of like baking soda, oatmeal bath. So things you can add to the bath. Emollient, uh, bath emollients are excellent for helping. Remember back in the day when everybody got chicken pox, one of the things your mom would do is put you in an oatmeal bath to help with that itching. On the same lines, that calamine lotion that you can use. Um, Ways to prevent the scratching specifically on a younger child, especially babies, you can put mittens on them, um, and that often helps. You want to make sure you're teaching pa parents when it comes to skin lesions. The most important thing to teach them regarding preventing infection is washing that lesion with soap and water. That is the most important. Um, I know a lot of people still use hydrogen peroxide. I use it myself. But these other items, iodine, hydrogen peroxide, um, alcohol, all of these should not be used as cleaning items when we're talking about wounds because studies have shown that it these also disrupt normal skin and reduce that rate of healing along with um, destroying the bacteria and whatnot that may cause infection. So occasionally depending on the provider they do like to use half strength peroxide but ultimately the best thing you can really use is just straight old-fashioned soap and water so some of the disorders you might see something called seborrheic dermatitis it's where they get these crusty yellow lesions or crusty yellow scales on their head and face is most commonly where you see it. You see it in infants a lot, but you can see it in older ages. Even adults can have it. In infants, you'll often hear it referred to as cradle cap. If you've ever heard of cradle cap, that's what this is. Um, it doesn't cause itching. It doesn't cause really any problems per se, but you don't want to leave those thick scales adhered to their head or face or wherever it be. It can kind of look similar to eczema, but it's scaly yellow instead of just being red. Um, so the treatment for this is um, shampooing will help loosen it up, but really the best way to, to remove all that crusting um, is what you teach patient parents is to use uh, mineral oil or baby oil or something oily like that, and you put it over it to soften and um, separate those lesions, for, or not lesions, but scales from the skin. And then you'll use that soft baby brush to kind of pull them away. Um, when you're talking about a teenager, the dandruff shampoos can help as well to help get those scales off that head. So dermatitis is just an inflammation of the skin. So diaper dermatitis is something you see a lot especially in your diapered children, obviously. Um, you can get it as well in undiapered children, even children that are old or even adults sometimes. You can get perennial irritation, and it's basically the same thing. Or not basically, it is the same thing, but we refer to it as diaper dermatitis because the diaper creates a warm, moist, dark environment, which is perfect environment for not only skin irritation, but fungal infection. So it really just creates this bad place um, for diaper rash. You've probably heard this referred to as diaper rash. Same thing. Um, while urine, feces, soaps, especially people that use um, cloth diapers and they wash them at home. Um, the soaps that may be used to clean those diapers can become irritating, the friction. And again, that warm, moist, constant moisture exposure really does a job on our skin and not in a good way. Um, sometimes children that have food allergies, you'll see where they get the diaper dermatitis, depending on whether it's just the skin irritation or sometimes whatever is in their stool where they're reacting with that food, the stool becomes more acidic and more irritating, and that can lead to that breakdown as well. Um, the way you can determine the difference in your standard diaper dermatitis that you use desitin in versus your candida infected diaper dermatitis. So when you have a fungal infection that has developed over that, is that beefy red rash that easily bleeds. When you go to wipe their bottom, it just oozes blood, like in the picture you see here. That's an example of a candida or fungal infection. It is not the urine, the feces, the friction, all that stuff that causes that beefy red rash 
that bleeds easily. That is a hallmark symptom you are going to want to know specifically related to fungal infections. So treatment of diaper dermatitis, treatment as well as prevention, there's a lot of over-the-counter creams. Um, really the most active ingredient in those creams that helps is the zinc oxide. So you'll see some of them like Desitin or, or Maximum Strength, usually because they have a higher concentration of zinc. Um, there's also ones that will have barrier to them, meaning they create a barrier from the moisture and they keep that moisture from getting on the skin. Usually these very thick barrier ones, like the ones you see in the hospitals, you don't want to remove every time. You want to clean it, and if there's stool stuck to it or whatnot, you do want to, to wipe off the top surface, but you don't want to be, because those barriers are made to really adhere to the skin. So if you're scraping it off every time you change that diaper, you're further degrading that skin that's underneath. So you really don't fully remove it every time. Um, if there is a fungal infection involved, like in the picture with that beefy red rash um, that bleeds easily, Nystatin topical cream is usually the treatment for that. And you can use that um, along with hydrocortisone sometimes, a topical hydrocortisone. It helps decrease that inflammation. Although the caveat to that is when you have a fungal infection, sometimes that hydrocortisone can actually make the situation worse. So you wouldn't always use those together. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but sometimes that's how they'll diagnose whether they have a fungal infection if it's not super obvious, is they'll try hydrocortisone first. And if it flares up even worse, then that's a sign that there is some fungal infection going on there as well. So other treatment methods, those emollients I mentioned, um, have soaking them in. This helps with eczema as well. Sometimes those emollients can help just soothe. It's very irritating. Um, another uh, one of the big important things, though, regarding prevention as well as treatment of this is keep, keeping that skin as clean and dry as possible. Um, in the hospital, we will often, and I, I did it with my own children at home when they would get, um, just leave the diaper off them. We would just put a chucks pad under the baby, especially a younger baby that's not going to roll around as much, and you just leave them open to air. Take that diaper off. Let that skin breathe and dry out. That warm, moist, dark environment is what's going to contribute to this the most. We used to use in the hospital, it's no longer a recommended practice because of the risk of burns. Um, we used to lay them in a prone position with their diaper off and we'd use sun lamps directed towards their bottom so that it would help dry it out anymore. That's no longer a recommended practice because of the risk of burns. But it, it that drying is what's really important. So keeping them open when you can is really one of the best ways to prevent as well as treat this situation. So then we have acne mulgaris, which is just your inflammatory acne when we're talking about it. This is in the the teenage population, you see it most commonly. Um, you do see it more commonly in Caucasian populations, but it happens in all races. Um, so this is where those sebaceous glands and hair follicles get inflamed. Um, they can get little pustules inside. They can get infected. Um, they can get debris stuck under those pores. Um, and that's where you'll get the white heads and the black heads and all. Um, so this is often seen in, like I said, your teenage population when you start puberty. Those hormonal changes is the biggest contributor to acne. Um, you'll see this when adults have adult acne. A lot of times when they break out, it's because like in women, they're about to have their period or whatnot, those hormonal changes. Um, so things that do not contribute to acne that are often old wives' tales or used to be believed contributors um, are no longer believed to be contributors is diet, um, specific diet items, I mean. So things like chocolate, soda, um, greasy foods, those used to be thought of as contributors to acne, and they are not. They do not contribute to the situation, so they there's no need to avoid those. Um, a balanced diet is important, um, meaning eating a good good sources of vitamins and minerals, balancing out carbs and protein and your fats in your diet. But a specific type of food is no longer considered a contributor to acne. So another important factor is 
facial cleaning. Obviously, you do want them to wash their face, um, but you want to make sure they're not washing their face too much. Um, when your face is breaking out and irritated, um, the first thing you want to do is keep wash in your face and this can actually be a bad thing because your body as you know is a compensatory system it's going to find ways to make up for things it needs so if you're washing your face too much your body is going to produce more sebaceous oils to make up for that drying of the skin that you're creating so by creating even more oil it's just making the problem worse and you're increasing that irritation which can break down that skin by washing too much so excessive cleaning should not be used no more than twice a day um, at the most for washing your faces um, so routine skin cleaning is the best way to prevent this but only as recommended for people that have more um, serious Acne, there are other medications besides routine cleaning that can be used over the counter. They have salicylic acid, they have peroxide based products, um, but sometimes patients need prescription medications. Um, it is, again, it's very important with all of these medications, especially to teenagers, to teach them how important it is to follow the directions to make sure they're getting what they need. Um, some important things to know about those over the, or not over the counter, your, um, Prescription medications, especially your oral, when people think of the oral medication, sometimes people will be on oral antibiotics like your doxycycline, for instance, a low dose doxycycline will help prevent those flare ups. Um, but retin A specifically, make sure you know about retin A. Um, some very important precautions related to retin A, and there's two. One of them is that they need to avoid sun as much as possible. They need to be wearing hats when they're outside. They need to stay in the shade when they're outside. And they need to wear sunscreen all day, every day, because the sun sensitivity with this medication is great and it can really cause burns. Um, the other important thing is emphasizing birth control. In fact, in some high-risk populations, they will recommend two forms of birth control for patients that are on this because it is so well known to cause birth defects um, in anybody who is taking this medication, um, and as well as miscarriage. So oftentimes they will um, very greatly stress you have to be on some kind of birth control. So infantile eczema, also known as atopic dermatitis, a lot of times you've probably just heard this referred to as eczema. Um, it is often has an allergy nature to it. Um, they often go together in pediatrics. We refer to it as the asthma, eczema, allergy triad. You'll see those three often coming together. Um, it has to do with that hypersensitivity. Um, <clears throat> so it can happen anywhere on the body. You'll see it on the face. You'll see it on the chest. Um, you do see it a lot on the face, though. And this, the, the if you do lab work, it does show where those eosinophils are elevated. So it is definitely an allergic response. Um, this can happen in adults as well as children, but you do think of it more in children. Um, so some treatment. Treatment for this is aimed at, one, relieving pruritus which hopefully by now you know pruritus means itching that's important um, one for comfort but like I mentioned earlier to prevent those secondary infections keeping the skin hydrated super super important um, that this is not unlike the diaper dermatitis you want to keep dry this population you want to keep moist and I don't mean soaking them in water I mean applying very thick um, Oil, these are ones you're going to use as oil based creams um, to hold in that moisture. Usually, the best routine for managing this is they'll take a bath. Um, often, bath oils are recommended to be added to the water in the bathtub to help it absorb. Um, emollients are also recommended to be added to the bathtub, like your baking soda and your um, oatmeal and all to calm down that irritated skin. As soon as they get out of the shower or bathtub, they should be toweled down without completely drying them and then application of some thick oil-based cream 
to hold in. Aquaphor is a very common one that we use. Some patients will even use Vaseline, which also works very well. Um, in the hospital, when we had patients that had severe, severe eczema, we used to do something called wet to dry pajamas, and it's exactly what it sounds like. After we would bathe them, we would coat them head to toe in a thick layer of Vaseline. Then we would put a pair of wet pajamas on them, and then over that put a dry pair of pajamas. It sounds horrible, and um, they uh, they usually slept pretty well, actually, I guess, because we would be giving them diphenhydramine as well to help calm down that histamine release. But um, it, I can only imagine how uncomfortable that was, but it really, really worked to keep that moisture to the skin. So using those emollients, using those... Um, bath oils in the bath water using those heavy topical greens like your Vaseline and all. Another thing that is recommended um, that really works well is bleach baths. Um, studies have shown this greatly decreases that infantile eczema and I'm not real sure why because bleach is actually drying to the skin and this is a population you don't want to dry out their skin but it really does work. So you add a small amount of bleach to their bath water, very small, like half a cup to an entire bathtub and um, it does help decrease and I think it more works on that bacteria on the skin that could be aggravating. Um, so some other things they might be on, if it gets infected, they may, which it can, it's a breakage in the skin, they may put them on antibiotics. Oftentimes topical corticosteroids are used, um, so you want to make sure you're only using it as prescribed because they have such a high body surface area and absorption rate from those medications, as well as using things to help with the, the itching, like your diphenhydramine and so on, whether it be topical or oral. And then like I mentioned, that Aquaphor or another one we commonly use is Eucerin. That's another good brand um, specific, and they make products specifically tailored to eczema. Um, so some other things that are important as far as prevention and decreasing that inflammation is wearing cotton clothes. Um, cotton breathes better, and it's going to um, help be more... Um, comfortable on the skin. Also important when you're talking about clothing is making sure they're using like your dye-free and fragrance-free products to wash those clothing and bedding. Um, and they make one specifically for babies, patients with sensitivities, um, and that's the two things in it, the dyes and the... Um, the fragrances are taken out of those. Um, you also don't want them using fabric softener. For that reason, fabric softener is really all it is is it's going to provide a lot of those products that are irritating to the skin. Um, this can often be associated with food allergies as well. You especially see it in the milk allergy population um, can cause this to flare up. So just possibly looking at different things in their diet that may be contributing to it as well and, as el and eliminating those items. So something you see in adults as well as children is impetigo. Impetigo is caused most commonly by a staph infection, but topical strep infections can cause it as well. You will see um, the hallmark symptom associated with this, the way you'll see it in writing, is thick honey-crusted lesions. And you can see in the picture they'll often have this yellow golden crusting over where the lesion is. It is highly contagious. The crusting comes from the weeping of these... Um, lesions. So frequent hand, frequent washing of this site several times a day is very important and keeping it covered is very important to keep it from spreading because it spreads very, very easily. Um, you want to be removing the crust each time they wash the site. They should be lightly scrubbing just to remove that top crusting because once that crust forms, the medications can't get to where they need to be. Um, they'll often use mupiracin or Bactroban, which is a topical an antibiotic, um, and that helps clear it up very well. But it is very contagious. So tinea infections or fungal infections, what people often... Um, call them. These are related to a fungus infestation. So very common in children. You see them in adults as well. And they are described by their location. For instance, when you have tinea capitis, that's a fungal infection in the scalp. 
Actinia corporis, that's on the body. So that top picture you see, ringworm, is kind of that layperson term. You hear it called a lot, that tinea corpus or that body fungal infection. And it's called ringworm because it has that distinct ring around it a lot of times. Tinea pedis is your, your foot fungal infections. And then cruris is your jock itch or your genital fungal infections. So one way to diagnose this is using a woods lamp. Um, and you'll see this in different areas if you work in the ER or work in um, um, dermatology clinics or various clinics. A lot of times you'll see a woods lamp. And what you do is you it's essentially like a black light. It's exactly what it is. And you shine this woods lamp over the area. And that's the two pictures or the picture on the bottom left that you see. When you shine that black light on a fungal infection, it will actually glow. Almost like that you have um, put glow paint or something on it. So that's how they can identify if it's a bacterial versus a fungal infection to help guide how to treat that. Um, most tinea infections are treated with topical creams, um, your antifungal creams. So your tenactin is an excellent example. Um, and teaching with this is very, very important because this does not go away in a week. It does not go away overnight. A lot of patients I've seen um, when I worked at KidMed where I was on the outpatient sector, they would treat them and after a few days they'd be coming back because it wasn't any better. One of the biggest important teaching points is on this is even with meticulous use of that cream several times a day, it still takes at least three to four weeks, sometimes as long as six for it to go away. So it's very important to tell them, keep at it. It will go away, but you have to keep doing it every single day. You can't slack on it. The one area that is different where you have to give oral antifungal medications is on the scalp. Um, because they don't penetrate on the scalp the same way because of the hair that's there. Um, they have to take oral antifungal medications, the most common one being called griseofulvin. Um, this medication, just like the topicals, they have to be on a lot of times for four to six weeks, um, sometimes longer, depending on the severity. Um, usually the way you identify this, they may have the red circular lesions as well, but a lot of times what's more likely to see is alopecia. They'll have spots of hair loss. And I've seen children with spots of hair loss where it's, um, for instance, children that keep braids in their hair where the braids may have been too tight and it pulls. But more than likely, those spots are actually a fungal infection. Um, so using dandruff shampoo can help, especially Selsun Blue. That's a really good one that helps with that. But it's not going to get rid of it. It's just going to help. They have to go on those oral um, antifungal medications. The problem with oral antifungal medications is they're very hard on the liver. So you, you don't want to use them unless you have to. Um, if you, when you have toe, nail infections, toenail infections, oftentimes the um, topical, I mean the, the oral has to be used as well because it's under that nail and you can't, don't have topicals that can penetrate. So some other important things with griseofulvin, one, how long they have to be on it, and two, this is another one that causes great sun sensitivity. So when they're on it, they have to be very careful being out in the sun. They can get burned really easily. And keeping the area dry, remember, like I mentioned, fungal infections love warm, dark, and moist. So keeping that skin dry is absolutely important to, one, help it clear up as well as prevent it from getting worse. So the next thing we're going to talk about, again, can occur in any age, adults as well, but we typically think of children when we think of this is pediculosis, which is your lice. Um, there are three different types, and these, just like the tinea or the fungal infections, are categorized by where they are located. So capitus, again, means head, so that's your head lice. That's what most people think of when they think of lice as head lice. Um, then you have your corporis, which is your body lice, and then you have your pubis, which is your pubic lice. Um, so the three ways these are transferred, they're all transferred by contact, close contact. Um, generally, your pediculosis capitis can jump three feet away. So you don't have to necessarily wear a hat of somebody else's or use their um, hair scrunchies and all or um, 
share a comb or, or towels, you can be within a couple feet of them and they can jump over to each person's head. So that's why they are so likely to um, transfer from person to person. Your corporis type and your pubis type do require direct contact. So your pediculosis pubis is considered a sexually transmitted disease. This is what people often refer to as crabs. Um, your pediculosis corporis is contact, close contact. Um, the difference in capitis and corporis is hygiene. So most people think of lice as a hygiene issue. When we're talking about pediculosis corporis or body lice, it is a hygiene issue. You're going to see this in your homeless population. You're going to see it in people who have poor hygiene. Pediculosis capitis, however, contrary to popular belief, is not related to hygiene. In fact, the capitis form actually prefers clean, straight hair. Um, so meticulous hair washing can actually increase your risk of getting the pediculosis capitis. So this is not related to poor hygiene. It is actually, more, you do see it more in the Caucasian population because again, it does like straight fine, thinner hair, it can stick to it better. Um, and that's why you do see it more, but it doesn't mean that all races cannot get it because they can. Um, the picture you see on the top are what called are called nits. A lot of times you'll see, you may see these more so than you'll see the bugs themselves. Um, and these are often seen all attached to the hair shaft and they look like little smaller than rice, but they almost look like rice. You'll often see them at the bottom hairline near the neck behind the ears, but you can see them all over the place. A good way to determine if it's a knit or if it's dandruff, because sometimes they can look very much the same, is brush at it. If it's dandruff, it should brush right off. If it's a knit where it's attached to the hair shaft, it's not going to brush right off, and that's a good way to determine. This usually causes intense itching, so a lot of times the, the way you know a child has lice is when they're digging at their head all the time and you'll find that so the only treatment for this is where you have to wash with a special shampoo such as your NYX shampoo um, which is your anti-lice shampoo and then you actually have to comb out and you see on the bottom that's where they're combing out those nits and the bugs um, it is a very very fine tooth comb that will get, uh, detach those nits from the hair so cutting the hair does not help it's not going to get rid of them because they are attached very close to the scalp. Um, I guess if you shaved all your head, it possibly could, but some people think getting the hair cut shorter is not going is going to help, and it does not. Cutting the hair doesn't help. You have to wash that head with that shampoo. So usually the way this shampoo works is you, you coat the scalp with it, and it usually sits for a period of time, 20 to 30 minutes, and then you rinse it out, and then you comb it out. Um, a lot of recommendations are to repeat it in a week. Sometimes people don't need to, um, but lice can also attach to objects, um, like I mentioned, hats, um, any soft objects, bedding. So be anything that can be placed in the washing machine should be put in the washing machine on the hottest water you can get to kill them. Anything that can't be placed in the washing machine, like possibly pillows, stuffed animals, all your other soft objects, and this is soft objects, not all your hard objects, um, they should be placed in some kind of impermeable plastic, like in a trash bag or something, for at least two weeks so that they suffocate and die. Um, as far as carpeting at all, ex intense vacuuming is the way to suck up those um, bugs. So the other bug we're going to talk about that people often don't want to think of, and this is another one, you don't have to be a child to get this, is your scabies. This is a type of mite that occurs on the body. This creates extreme intense itching. The itching as that's actually called... What causes the itching, is you see on that bottom picture, the scaby itself burrows under the skin. And what's in that burrow is the scaby eggs and the scaby feces. So those feces that are buried under your skin are what are causing that intense itching. Sounds great, right? Um, so 
They do thrive in like body folds, so you'll see them around somebody's waistband on their pants. You'll often see it between the toes, between the fingers, those kinds of areas. Um, in an older person, like an adult, I mean older person, you may see it under the breast line or skin folds, things like that. Um, so treatment for this is very similar to the lice as far as you're going to use that topical, but instead of a shampoo, it's a topical cream, um, but it's it's usually permethrin is that active ingredient and what you do is you shower and then you coat the patient with this cream from head to toe the not just where they have the lesions but the entire body they get coated with this cream <laughs> this cream is then left on for 24 hours so that it can work and then they shower again in 24 hours. Sometimes, depending on the severity of it, they will recommend repeating it in a week, kind of like you do with the lice treatment, but not always. Um, it is also recommended that anybody that's in close contact, um, that lives in the house especially, should also be treated prophylactically because it is easy to spread. Um, scabies is another one of those things that people think is related to poor hygiene and all that. It is not. My sister-in-law caught it from a a hotel bed. It can happen to anybody. It's all just a matter of whether you come in contact with it. It has nothing to do with hygiene. That's another one of those old wives tales, but it is anybody can get this. So let's talk about burns. This is our last topic regarding skin, um, but it's a very important topic to go over. And we'll, we'll talk about more specifically related to childhood burns, but some of it will also be related to any population. So this is information no matter who you're caring for, whether it's an adult or a child, will still apply. So the types of burns, when most people think of a burn, they think of a thermal burn. So this can be um, related to touching something hot or cold. Um, the basic physiological process of what causes a burn is a sudden change in temperature of the skin. It's not just heat that can cause thermal burns, cold can as well. So that's kind of what that frostbite is. You can get cold thermal burns as well, but most people when they think of burns, they think of heat. You can have chemical burns, which is where something usually with a very high or very low pH, something very acidic or very alkaline can burn the skin. You can have electrical burns, you can have radiation burns. Although unless you're getting like radiation therapy, radiation burns are, are um, not very common unless you're talking about your sunburn. So burns can involve skin. They can also involve your mucous membranes. Um, the types of the, the degrees of burns are shown in a picture on the right hand side of your screen. Um, you can kind of compare these to the stages of pressure ulcers as far as how they are defined. So your first degree burn is your very superficial burn. There's no break in the skin. This is your redness. This is your typical sunburn. Um, it's just red. There's no, there's not really an increased risk of infection because there's no break in the skin. So your partial thickness or your second degree burn is a superficial burn. There, there's usually either a, a, a small crater or a blister. So burns that have blistering on them are your second degree burns. Um, important teaching parameters, these blisters should never be ruptured. The only time they should be ruptured is by a medical professional using sterile methods. So there have been times, especially if it's what we call a circumferential burn, meaning it circles around something like finger burns sometimes. If they circle all the way around the finger, you risk that chance of getting compartment syndrome in that finger from the swelling and the fluid buildup. So sometimes a medical professional will take a sterile scalpel or needle and they will rupture that blister to prevent those complications, but parents should be taught never to rupture blisters. They should be maintained intact. So then we have your full thickness or your third degree burns and often third degree and there is a fourth degree as well, but they're kind of lumped together almost like your full thickness um, pressure ulcers. So your full thickness is all the way through the skin. These are generally black in nature um, and oftentimes they are painless. So if you've ever had a burn, even a sunburn, you know how much burns hurt. But full thickness burns 
are not painful, at least not initially, because it is such a deep burn, it has actually destroyed the nerve endings at that site. So these are not painful, and they're often black in nature. Um, so as the skin starts to grow back, especially once they get those skin grafts, it can make a big difference. And then they start to have problems with intense pain, but initially painless. Um, so the two big things we worry about with burns related to the person is one, um, infection. So when you have degraded the integrity of the skin with a burn, there's two things you have decreased the skin's ability to do. One, and that's a big barrier to infection, and two, thermoregulation, regulating that temperature. So people often have trouble with um, regulating their temperature, especially with large-scale burns. Um, so as far as pediatric specific, why burns can be more intense in children than adults, again, their skin is thinner, so it has less uh, layers to go through. So something that might cause a first degree burn or even a second degree burn in an adult because there's less layers to go through, it could be a full thickness burn for that child dependent on the severity. They also have an immature response system, especially in your infants and your toddlers. You know, their systems are very immature, so they're more likely to go into shock, have renal dysfunction, all these other things that can be associated, those temperature instabilities. Um, they have a larger body surface area, so they have more risk for, for that thermoregulation, as well as the risk of a, an amount of a burn covering a greater surface in comparison. So when determining the percentage of burns, so when you hear the percentage of body surface area burn, when you're talking about burns, that's where they're determining how that percent of skin that is burned. So in adults, the picture you, and I don't want you to memorize these pictures, I just want you to use it as a gauge um, because the rule and I will talk about more in your med surge classes. But um, the picture on the left is what you'll hear referred to as the rule of nines. This can only be used in the adult population because as you know, as you can see with the two pictures, the body proportions in a child and an adult are very different. So that rule of nines is not going to be um, applicable in the pediatric population. So basically the rule of nines is each body area is 9%. So your larger or, or is a portion of a 9%, for instance, like your um, your head, the front of your face is 4.5%, the back, so if the whole head is burned, that's 9%. The chest, the front is 18%. Um, again, and children, we can't use that because their proportions are different. So the biggest way we use is the 1% hand rule. So you take the child's hand, not your hand, but the child's hand, and that child's palm is equivalent to 1%. So you could actually lay their hand over the burn and the, or the burned area to determine what body percentage of their body surface area that is. So burn care, this is really the most important part. The very first thing you need to do, well, the first assessment is to make sure they have an airway, which we're going to talk about in a second if there's potential for airway burns. But the very first information intervention is to cool that burn off. So what this encompasses, first, you need to remove anything that's on that part of the body. This can include jewelry, because you know metal retains heat, so it is going to make that burn worse. This includes clothing, um, unless the clothing is stuck to the burn. You don't want to peel it off the burn, but generally things like your cottons and all, it can easily be removed. Um, your synthetic fibers, back when I did home ec in middle school, we did this project with a Bunsen burner where we burned different materials um, to see what they did when they burn. And your synthetic ones, like polyester and all, they don't turn to ash like your cotton, they actually melt like a plastic. So if they have a synthetic um, material on, it can just melt to their skin and you don't want to pull that off because you're going to make that worse. So first thing, remove whatever you can. Second thing is to cool it off with cool running water or tepid room water. You don't want 
ice. You know, the old wives' tales put butter on it or mayonnaise or some kind of oil-based thing. These are never a good idea because that oil is just holding in that heat and you're making it worse. Um, you don't ever want to put ice on it. People have talked about putting ice because you think you want to cool it down as quick as possible. However, like I mentioned on the first burn slide, a burn... The pathology of a burn is that sudden change in temperature. It's not so much whether it's hot or cold. It's that sudden rapid temperature change. So when you go from where they have a heat thermal burn, now you're going to make it worse by drastically changing it to the cold side. So it will make the burn worse by doing that. So you don't want to use ice. You don't want to use anything oil-based. Just cool running water, usually for at least 10 to 15 minutes. So after that initial cooling process where you have removed everything you can, especially jewelry, um, you have cooled the burn off with cool running water, then you need to worry about cleaning it. Um, and you need to worry about keeping it from getting infected and keeping it covered. So once you've stopped the burning process, you're going to evaluate the injury. You're going to cover it. Um, even on the outpatient, you want to at least cover it with, remember, this needs to be sterile gauze because... This is now breakdown of the skin. They're going to go to the hospital more than likely, depending on the severity of the burn. On a first degree burns, a lot of times those are done outpatient, but second and third degree, especially your third degree, are going to require hospitalization. Don't forget pain relief. If you've ever had a burn, you know burns are extremely painful, um, even your first degree burn. So making sure that you're ensuring that pain relief, um, and especially with wound care and all, Wound care is very painful. I've had children with extensive burns where they actually take them to the OR and completely knock them out like you would for surgery just to do wound care because it is so painful and extensive for some of these children. Um, when I talk about chemo prophylaxis, you know prophylaxis means preventative. So this is prevention of infection. So oftentimes they will be put on preventative antibiotics just to keep that from getting infected. Very, very important to prevent that infection. So emergency care. Again, the first thing, just like, you know, I've said before, when your, your assessment priorities are your ABCs. Same case in here. You want to see if there is a potential for an airway burn that could have happened. So signs of an airway burn may be obvious. If they're cyanotic, <laughs> then that there's probably been some airway involvement. If, um, but some, sometimes it's more subtle. Like if they have any kind of singed hair or soot on their face, that is a, a most definite sign that they've had some kind of airway injury. And it's not always just flames that have gotten into their airway where they've had the thermal injury, but it could be, um, from the, 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 um, the smoke and all as well. So because of that flash edema that can happen, you can get that anywhere you get a burn, and you've probably seen it yourself where you get swelling and inflammation at the site of a burn. The airway is a bad place to have edema. Um, so often um, so with these patients, so oftentimes with these patients, they will um, just prophylactically intubate them because you want to get that ET tube in while they still have an airway because if you wait until there's a problem, it's probably going to be too late and that airway is going to be so swollen, you will not be able to get an airway in or even bag them. So I've seen many kids when they'll come into the ER, um, even if it's just suspected, even if their SATs are fine, even if they have no respiratory distress, they will go ahead and intubate them just to be sure because it's better to be proactive than reactive. Another thing you might see as far as a subtle symptom, they may just have this cough, this dry, irritated, <laughs> you know, like something is bugging them. That's another symptom. So in this case, if you think that there is a potential for an airway burn, that airway becomes that priority. While yes, cooling is important, airway, if you don't establish that airway first and assess that airway, it's not really going to matter whether you cool that burn in a few minutes. So nursing care in general, after that initial care where you have cooled the burn off and you have removed all your jewelry, you have determined that they have an airway, um, protective isolation 
is super important because these patients have a huge risk of infection. And the larger the burn, the bigger risk of infection. Not so much with your first degree burns, but again, these are ones that are usually managed at home. Patients that are hospitalized with burns, huge infection risk. You have degraded their number one barrier against infection. So that'll be protective isolation. Um, and what I mean by protective isolation is where they're put in isolation to protect themselves. So instead of it being contact droplet and airborne where we're trying to keep from getting something from them, we're trying to keep from giving them something because of their infection risk. And their body is so overloaded with their immune system trying to heal that burn that if they get an infection, it can be very um, devastating to their body. So everything we do is sterile. Instruments that are used are sterile. Dressings are sterile. Um, ointments are applied with sterile techniques because you want everything as super clean as possible. Um, you want to make sure you're monitoring for especially subtle signs of infection. It could just be where they have mood changes. It could just be where they have temperature instability. It might not be a fever, remember, especially in your younger patients. And then especially in this where they really don't have that thermoregulation because you've taken away their skin, they can have that as well, those temperature instabilities. Monitoring for fluid overload. When patients have a major burn, you have a lot of shifting. Um, we're not going to talk about the Parkland formula because it's not talked about in your book. Uh, but there is actually a formula we use to determine how much fluid resuscitation they get. So they get a huge whopping amount of fluid through their IV in the first 24 hours. For an average adult patient, it's probably about three to four liters of fluid um, because they are going to start having that third spacing or that shifting of fluid. So you don't want them to shift that fluid where it's going to send them into shock. And then after that 24 hours, they start to reabsorb that fluid and then they'll pee it out. But during that first 24 hours, you're at great risk of having um, fluid deficit if you don't pump them up with those fluids. Diet, super, super important. Um, the macronutrient, most important for healing in general, as you know, is protein. They need a lot of protein. They need a lot of calories. The body is, even if they're just laying in the bed sick because they have the bur a burn, physiologically, they are working really hard. Their body is working really hard to um, heal this burn. So their metabolism is actually going to be higher. Their metabolic needs is going to be higher. So high protein, high calorie, very important. And prevention of contractures, depending on the severity, they are oftentimes immobilized or laying in the bed so they can get those contractures, especially as skin heals because of that thin skin, especially in peds, they get more scarring and that scarring gets tight. Have you ever had seen a tight scar? Um, and it, it, when it gets tight, it can contribute to those contractures as well. So nursing care, your primary nursing care is assessing to see if they have an airway. If there's not an issue with airway, you want to remove anything. You, and a lot of times this is all happening at once. If they're standing there talking to you or screaming because they're hurting, they got an airway. Move on. Um, but then you're going to take off everything you can clothes, jewelry, whatever it be, and you're going to cool it with cool water, no ice and no oil-based products. Um, after that initial care, you're going to wrap them in sterile gauze, clean the sites. Um, so protecting them from fluid volume shifts, protecting them from infection, that's the big, big, big one, and then monitoring for thermoregulation issues is the big part of your care afterwards.